2 Kings chapter number 2 and verse number 19. The Bible says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein, and they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed, those, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Father, thank you for your word, and God, I thank you for the word of God. Thank you for stories uh, that illustrate great, wonderful truths um, for our Christian life. And God, I pray that you'd speak to us tonight. And Lord, help each person to be open to the scriptures and open to the truth that you've impressed on my heart to share tonight. And God, I pray that you guide me. May I be controlled by you, please. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all go ahead and be seated if you would. I remember each summer after camp um, having a testimony service. Most of the Sunday nights after camp at the church I grew up at, we would have that. And uh, some of the, usually after the teenagers uh, or or some of the teenagers that had something to say, my pastor would have them stand up. Uh, sometimes he'd have all of us stand up, so there'd be like 30 teenagers lined up across the platform, and a pastor would stick a microphone in front of their face and say, you know, what, what happened at camp? And about half the guys would say something along the lines of, it was fun, the food was good, I can't wait till next year. You know, and you'd hear the same thing again, I had fun, food was good, can't wait till next year, that kind of stuff. But every now and then, there'd be somebody, and sadly, it was often the girls, um, that had something spiritual to say. Um, but they'd share, uh, both guys and girls, I remember sharing heartfelt testimonies of decisions they made, things they decided to give up, some sinful things from their life that they got right with God, um, usually something along the lines of worldly music that they were going to throw away, uh, maybe stop dressing immodestly, maybe to change friends from bad friends to good friends, and uh, maybe to start reading their Bible, to start praying, to start walking with God. Um, but lots of things where God taught them important things to help them with their Christian life and help them be more obedient Christians. And uh, I remember in 2001, again, I mentioned a moment ago, standing um, in front of our church um, and got to tell my church family that that night or that week I trusted Christ to be my Savior. Um, and I remember sharing just my testimony, what God had done in my life. And uh, I had no idea all the things that that one decision would impact and how my life would be different and, and how God would work. I was thinking about that this past week, and I told you, I think, this past Sunday, last Sunday, um, that I was, I'd probably share. You know, I think I joked about stealing all the preacher's messages, um, but it's on the internet, so I can't do that. But uh, this past week, you know, Levi and I got to go to the National Sword Lord Conference there in Tennessee. And it's like, it's like camp for old, you know, senior citizens, but uh, for old, fundamental, independent Baptists. Um, we, uh, we were some of the younger ones there, but there's a few of them. But uh, there's no games and activities, um, just a lot of singing, preaching, and um, I'm not sure exactly how to say this, but um, having my sins and shortcomings uh, nailed to a wall, my face ripped off, things like that, getting a kick in the rear end, uh, try to help me get right with God and me be a better pastor. And so uh, it's like camp in that way where uh, God got a hold of my heart. And um, this message is kind of an expression of some things that uh, God worked in my heart about. And I'll, you'll see when we get there. But in 2 Kings 2, uh, the, prophet Elijah, the prophet Elijah was completing life's race. His life was almost over. Uh, Elijah had completed the things that God had for him to do. We know that because God was about to take him. And in this chapter, a couple of verses before we just the verse we read, Elijah was taken, um, very pretty much got raptured, <laughs> uh, was caught away in a whirlwind. It's a little bit different than what we would experience, but it's a picture of that, I think. But Elijah finished his ministry of preaching and healing and helping. And um, before he did, just a couple of chapters before that, at the end of First Kings, he trained his replacement, Elisha, uh, to take his place. And in the end of the chapter of Second Kings 2, we find the first miracle that God used, that, that God allowed Elisha, the second man, Elisha, to perform. And we find that of him healing the water there. Look in verse 21 again of chapter number 2. And we'll look at pretty much this whole chapter, most of this chapter in a moment. But verse 21, it says, And he went forth unto the spring of waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. 
There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So God, you know, salt doesn't heal a well or a spring, but God does. God can do what He wants to do. So God allowed Elisha to pour this, uh, this amount of salt into the water, and God healed it and fixed it so that people wouldn't thirst to death, so that people could have water for their crops and, and things like that. But it's interesting in, the verse, um, in verse number 19, notice that again. He says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, so the city of Jericho there, this men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant. Think about that. The, si- the situation of the city is pleasant. Everything's good here. Life is great. The city's beautiful. We're happy. Everything's wonderful. The situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. Everything's great, but there's no water. Everything's wonderful, but the ground's barren. We can't grow crops. Life is great, but we have nothing to eat and drink. That's so weird that they would say it that way, but that's exactly what they said there. The water, he says, it's not. Not that, it, not that it doesn't exist, but the water is not as it's bad in that way. So not equals bad in this verse. The water will make us sick. In fact, based on the healing verse, verse 21, it would make them die if they drank it. You don't want to drink water if it's going to kill you. But that's the kind of water they had, the dying kind of water. So that they had water, but you didn't want to drink it. So no good water. They had no good water. And if that's the case, if you have no supply of good water in your city, that nothing else really matters. It doesn't matter what else you have. It doesn't matter how pretty the scenery is, if there's no water to drink, then you're going to die. So water, we know, is just common sense. Water is the, is the sustainment of life. There's no water. But the rivers that were there there were no good, um, whatever there was there. Uh, that's because God, and uh, maybe there's no water there because God had stopped the rain. There's no blessing there. No water, no good water. That means that they'll have no crops. The, the ground was barren. There's no good water, which means they have nothing to drink. So you cannot live without water because the, the crops won't grow. There's no rain. There's nothing to drink, so they'll thirst to death. So the Bible shows us that, that they are in a terrible situation. The city was in desperate need. And the Bible shows us several things that water represents in Scripture. You can put my title up there if you want to. But in John, uh, I'll just read these to you. In John 14. In verse 13, you'll know these things, but John 4, verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. So there in John 4, water is a picture of everlasting life, that spring, that well. So water is life, water is everlasting life in that verse, which we, that makes sense, water being that. But in Ephesians 5.26, we find water again. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So it deals with Christ and the church and things like that. But it deals with how water is a cleansing agent, washed by the water of the word. So not, on, not only does water give life, but water cleanses. Water cleanses our life. It reveals what's sinful. It reveals what's true. It reveals the, what, it, what we should get, get away from and things that we should grow in. And it shows us how we can get our life cleaned up so we can please God. So water gives life. Water cleanses our life. Hebrews 10.22 gives a similar thing. He says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So again, water is a picture of being washed, cleansed in salvation there, or just repentance. But water gives life. It cleanses our soul. It cleans up our life so we can be right with God. And we can be right with God today through the spiritual water that God offers. So we find a picture here. And the city of Jericho says, everything's great, but we have no water. That's kind of how America is. That's kind of how... Our communities are, and that's how sometimes churches can be. Everything's great. The bills are paid. The building's nice. The air conditioner works. We're moving. We're, you know, we're not stagnant necessarily, but we're moving. We're doing something. There's busyness going on. Everything's great, but there's no life. We exist. As a country, we exist. We have beautiful landscapes and things like that. But our country's in a mess, isn't it? Uh, there's, no spir- there's not a whole lot of spiritual life going on, right? So there's a great need. And, and the message here, and the, the passage here, it made me think this. And they go, the, the people of Jericho, <clears throat> they go to the prophet Elisha. They think everything's great except for this one thing. Elisha, everything's great. The city is pleasant, but there's no water. 
And it gives us the, the idea, this principle, the city needs you. Elisha, we think everything's okay, but we know better than that. Our city, we need you, Elisha. We need God to do something here. It's not that they need Elisha. It's not that they need this man. But they need the man of God to be able to get communication with God and to see the power of God. We, the city needs you because the city needs God. We're in, we're, everything looks good, but things are not good. The city needs you. There's no water. There's no life here. Elisha, will you do something to save us, to rescue us? So he takes the cruise of salt and pours in the spring and heals the waters. God healed the waters. It wasn't Elisha, but God healed the waters and saved the city. But in that moment, the city needed Elisha. The city needed God, more specifically. They needed someone that could help them save the city. Well, who was Elisha? Why, why did they call Elisha? Why is he the you that the city needed? If we back up in the passage, we find several things about Elisha that I think, and I want to make this point in aiming at our city. There's around 20,000 soldiers in Fort Stewart that because we have some obstacles reaching, getting on base, things like that. We have the city of Hinesville with another 40 or so thousand people. If my numbers are right, it's around there. We have Ludowisi. We have Allenhurst. We have Riceboro. We have Flemington. We have Midway. There's lots to do. Though we're here, and though our bills are paid, and again, I love our church, but I'm just saying our bills are paid, things are comfortable, we're doing well, we've got money in the bank, we're building, and we're making the things look better, and we're um, getting a kitchen and bathrooms and things like that, things are pleasant. But in our city, there's things that must be done. If there's other independent Baptist churches in the area, there's no more in the city of Hinesville. I'm sure there's other gospel, pre I'd imagine there's other gospel preaching cities in the city, gospel preaching churches in the city of Hinesville. When I think of the city of Hinesville, the things are pleasant, but there's no water. There's very little life. We run about 100 people. We had almost 100 people here this morning. There's people that belong to our church that aren't here, that weren't here. So let's say there's 20,000 plus 40,000, that's 60,000, do math. I mean, it's 59,900 people give or take, let's, let's, you get what I'm saying, need the Lord. There's people that have salvation, but they're not in church, they're not growing, and they're not walking with the Lord. There's people that go to other churches, the vast majority of the, ch the, the churches in Hinesville, they're not full, and the biggest church in town is not that big. There's not a whole lot of life here. There's not a whole lot of people that know Christ as their Savior. And if somebody is going to give them the gospel, it's going to be us. There are no other soul-winning churches in this town. None. They may have some kind of ministries, but knowing no biblical church is going after souls that I'm aware of. Our city needs life. Our city needs witnesses. Our city needs soul winners. Our city needs somebody to go after them and bring Jesus Christ to them. The city needs you. And I'm not talking about me. The city needs you. Our city needs you to take the truth to them. Some of you grew up here and you have families here. Your families need you. There's a work that needs to be done. And when, we look, when I look at Elisha here, why was it that they wanted Elisha? Why was it that the city of Jericho, they went to Elisha um, for this need and for this miracle? I'm going to give you three things tonight quickly, and I have to move really quickly. I just saw the clock, and you can all look at your phones and watches and know how much time I need. Um, but three things quickly, very, very quickly, of what God is looking for us to have and our city really needs, whether they see it or not. And you can write these things down. I'll go quickly. Number one, the city needs someone that is loyal to what God did in the past. And I'll explain. The city needs someone that is loyal to what God did in the past. Who was Elisha? At this point, he was a nobody. He had done nothing. He had just been around Elijah, but he had done nothing. He was a farmer just a few chapters before, and we haven't seen him really do anything. The only time we've seen him is when, God, when he was chosen by God and called by Elijah to serve alongside of him. If you go backwards, and let me give these points I'll just read it to you, and you can go quickly if you want to. In 1 Kings, um, that's not the right address, of course. In uh, 1 Kings, I think it's 19, uh, where we find him called 
Yes, it is. In 1 Kings 19, verse 19, so he departed thence and found Elisha. So this is the first time we find Elisha. So he, then, Elijah, he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he, with the 12th, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? So the first time we find Elisha is when Elijah calls him, son, you're going to follow me now. You're going to replace me in a little while. God had probably been working in Elisha's heart already. But Elisha, you're going to replace me. You're going to be, you're, you're going to be my assistant pastor for just a minute. And one day you're going to take my place. Elisha says, okay, that's fine. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. But first I need to go to mom and daddy and tell them I'm going. First, he was loyal to his parents. I think that matters. I don't think that's there by accident, but he is loyal to his authorities. He is loyal to his parents as a Christian should be. Obviously, this is Old Testament, but as a, as a believer in God should be honoring them before he goes. In 2 Kings 2, um, we won't read all of it. We go back to our passage. In 2 Kings 2, before Elijah goes, we find them traveling to three different places. Um, three different cities. Um, we find them at Bethel, Jericho, and Jordan. Wrong order, but in 1 Kings 1... Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 2, 2 Kings 2, verse 2. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. All right, Elijah, I'm sorry, Elisha, I want you to stay here. You're done, stay here. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Elijah, I'm not going anywhere. God has called me, and you already called me. You wanted me to follow you. I will follow you. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to do what God has told me to do. No matter what goes on, I will not leave you. No argument. Verse 3, And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Elisha, you know, all of his buddies come up. He, he gets to the first city, the sons of the prophets, the preacher boys. Elisha, uh, this is why you're confused by my preaching. Elijah's other disciples. The sons of the prophets. They go to Elisha. Hey man, pretty soon Elijah is going to be gone. He's not going to be at thy head anymore. He's not going to be your boss anymore. You're almost free from him. You get to take his place. You get to replace the man. He says, hold your peace. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. He's not excited in that way that he's going to be boss. Why? Because he's loyal to his preacher. He's loyal to the man of God to the one that he'd been following and serving because he's loyal to God. It's not a blind faith in a preacher that's wrong, but he's loyal to the man of God because that's where God put him. Elisha is loyal to God's calling on his life and the man of God that was leading him to do the will of God. He's loyal to God. He says it even there um, in the verses, as the Lord liveth, as long as God is alive, I'm going to do what God has called me to do. The loyal to, why was he loyal to his parents? Because the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. Why was he loyal to Elijah? Because Elijah called him and he says, I want you to follow me, but it was the will of God that Elisha follow him. The whole time, Elijah was, Elisha was faithful to God, was faithful to the principles of God and faithful to the word of God. It wasn't about mom and dad and them being perfect. It wasn't about a perfect preacher, but it was about God. It was about doing what was right. He was loyal to the word of God, loyal to, to the man of God. As Baptist people, this came up a lot this week, as Baptist people, we have a great heritage of men and women that have loved and served God. You, if, by the way, we are thankfully, and I won't say proudly, I'm thankful that we get to be independent, fundamental Baptist people. If you Google independent, fundamental Baptist, you'll find bad things. <gasps> people don't like actual Christians? Right. So anyways, and there's other people who are saved other than us. I get that. But, people, but you can Google anything you want to and find terrible things. But we are independent Baptists on purpose, and we're fundamental because we actually believe the Bible. And I'm not ashamed of that. But it's not about a title. It's not about a movement. It's about the Word of God. It's about being biblical Christians in a biblical church. And we ought to be faithful and loyal to what, not to a title, but to, to God and to what is true and right. But we need to be, be loyal to the timeless, eternal truths that God has laid out in scriptures. So no matter how our culture goes, we stay consistent, faithful, loyal to the Word of God. To what the Bible has taught and says is true. It's not about me. It's not about men of the past. It's about God. And honoring those that have done what was right. And honoring God. 
I hope that makes sense. But no matter how our culture goes, we will continue to stand by fundamentals of the faith, and there's more than that, but biblical truths that the Bible clearly proclaims, and be loyal to God's Word no matter the cost. Number two, the city needs someone that is laboring through hardship. That is laboring through hardship. In 2 Kings 2 verse 9, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. So after Elijah is taken, Elisha knows it's time. I'm not, I got ahead of myself. Um, Elijah is about to go. <laughs> He's about to leave. Everyone knows what's about to happen. The preacher boys, the sons of the prophets, have been telling him. But before Elijah leaves, Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee. Give me one final request. Okay? I want a double portion of thy spirit. What does that mean? Elijah, I've seen what God has done with you. I've seen the miracles that you've performed, that God has used you to perform. I've seen your courage as you stand before kings and how you've, you've trusted God most of the time. But I've seen how you've had great faith in God and courage to do what's right. I want that. I want to see God use me twice as much as He's used you. That's a hard thing, he says. And he said, thou hast, thou hast I can't talk, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. I was thinking about that. You've asked something hard. Thou hast asked a hard thing. Hard for who? Was it hard for Elijah to give it to him? No. Elijah would be dead. It has nothing to do with Elijah. Would it be hard for God? There's nothing too hard for him. Who's it hard for? Elisha. The difficulty was with Elisha. If you will be with me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. Elisha had to make the decision to be faithful, to continue doing what God had called him to do, and if he did, then he would have the double portion. God's been working in my heart for several months about what God could do here at our church, and it's not just a new thing, but that was part of the reason why we spent 10 weeks and talked about soul winning. Soul winning is... the is, the outward ministry is probably the most important ministry of our church. There's lots of things we do. But if we're not winning souls, we are not accomplishing God's purpose for us. Our goal is to see people saved and baptized and discipled, fulfill the Great Commission. If we're not doing that, we might as well close down because we're disobedient. That's the great work that God has called us to do. But I've been thinking, what could, what could God do in my life? What could God do in my family? What could God do in the ministries here? But the thing that I've known and tried to ignore, but the thing, one of the things that was hammered so much this week and God spoke to my heart about is how much work that it takes. Ministry is work. It's labor. That's why, you know, we talked about yesterday in the meeting, God wants us to pray for laborers people that will work. I've been convicted by the amount of people that I haven't seen saved. I'm not talking about by you, but me leading the Christ. And I know why. I know why I have not been seeing people saved like I want to in my own life. I've been unwilling to do the hard thing. I've been unwilling to work. I've been unwilling to go soul winning more. I'm unwilling to have the courage to push forward, be more, I don't know, talking about convincing somebody of something they've not done and making someone pray a prayer that they don't mean, but be aggressive. Try to see people saved. I've been unwilling to do the hard thing. I'd rather go home, have an evening at home, rather than go soul winning for an hour. And we have a soul winning program, and I go soul winning every week and make visits that you don't see either. But every one of us ought to be willing to do the work of obeying the Great Commission. Do you want to see people saved? I know you do. It's going to take work. It's going to take sacrifice. There will be things you cannot do if you're going to win souls for Christ. 
And I'm not just talking about sins and spiritual things. I'm talking about you have to sacrifice. You have to give up a night a week or a couple hours on Saturday mornings if you want to see people saved. Do you really want to see people saved? Then we have to do the work. There's a hard thing that must be done or it will never happen. We have to be willing to do the hard thing, the labor, the work in, in South Georgia in August, which is coming next week, to go out when you know you're going to sweat and stink and things like that, but you're still going to knock on doors and you're still going to tell people about Christ and you're still going to hand out gospel tracts and you're going to do the hard thing that people won't like you and people won't appreciate you and people might make fun of you and people might slam the door in, their, in your face. That's hard. I don't like it when people don't like me. I don't like it when people are rude to me or rude to you or rude to my kids when we're knocking on doors and trying to talk to people about Christ. But it's difficult. It's hard. I was thinking about what was hard for Elisha. It was only a little while he had to follow him. Part of the hardness was not just the labor. Part of the hardness was being there for the hurt of seeing his friend go. The emotional hurt. That's a hard thing. That's part of it too. There's a cost to serving God. If you don't ever pay a cost, it's because you're not serving the Lord. (laughs) There's a cost. I know you love the Lord. I know you try to serve the Lord. But I... Part of this is it's time to step up. <laughs> it's time to do more. In the next few weeks, we'll talk about some things. We're going to add some things. You can get involved. I'm not going to beat you up about it. But you ought to get involved. You've got to find a place to serve. Some of you are already serving. We must do more. There's no reason. There's no reason. And again, it's not just about numbers, but each number is a person. <laughs> but there's no reason why our church cannot grow. There's no reason why every pew cannot be full, every service. There's no reason why we, can't, why, why we only run one van. There's no reason why we can't run buses around the city and pick up people and bring them to Christ. There's no reason why we can't have people saved every week and baptized every week. There's no reason why they cannot be. But it starts with me. And I understand that. I'm preaching at me twice as much as I'm preaching at you right now. But we have to be willing to do the work or it'll never happen. We must be willing to labor through hardship. Let me go to the last one. Lastly, number three. The city needs someone that is looking to the Lord. The city needs someone that is looking to the Lord. Elijah is gone. He's taken in the, by the fiery chariot there. Verse 13, And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is Elijah? Is that what he said? Where is the Lord, God of Elijah. Elisha's, Elisha knew exactly what he needed. He didn't need a man from the past. He needed God. He needed the Lord. If he was going to have the double portion or a single portion or see anything from God, he needed the Lord. And he knew that immediately. Where is God? Where is the God that worked in the past? Where is God that worked in, in the revivals? Where is God that worked in the miracles in the, in the Old Testament? Where is God that has done all these things? God has not left. God has not changed. God is still available. In fact, the God that has created the universe and has saved your soul lives inside of you. Where is God? He's right here with you. He lives inside of you. He's available. God is available to work. But we have to be looking to the Lord and trusting Him and praying and getting on our knees and spending great times in prayer and the Word of God and, and begging God and asking God and expecting God to do something. We shouldn't just say, well, we'll try and see if it, see if it works. God's Word works. God's plan works. God's, God answers prayer. Let's fully expect God to do something. So it's not just, let's go try, try something out and add to new ministries. No, let's fully expect God to save souls. Why in the world should we not see people saved? Does the gospel still work? Does the Holy Spirit still convict people and draw people? Yes, He does. God is still at work. Let's fully expect God to do something. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He's still available to you. Every bit as much as he's available to to me or Elijah or Elisha, he's available to you. He's available. He's present. Let me read one verse to you and we'll be done in just a moment. Isaiah 55.1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. What's he saying? God is saying the water is available. And it's not just about water, it's about God. He's available. The cleansing wave of salvation, it's available. The power of the Holy Spirit is available. Well, I can't afford it. It's free. You've got to go get it. Without money, without price, the water's available. 
Our city needs God in their life. We must bring them the gospel. We must get real and be passionate and aggressive, not mean, not become jerks and hateful and forceful, but acknowledging and actually believing the fact of the Bible that people will die and go to hell. Actually believing that. And believing the truth that they could today. And actually believing that God is real and that God has commanded us to preach the gospel. Right? Yeah. Our city needs you. Every one of you. Some of you, your military, you're not going to be here in a year. The city you move to needs you. Folks, the men you work with every day, they need you. The women that you work with, they need you. Your next door neighbor, they need you. Your family members, they need you. So let's run to God, be what we should be. Be thoroughly right with God, be consistently obedient to God. Our city is filled with water that is not. False churches, garbage from the news, lies from politicians, ignorance from a life without God. We have the water. Let's bring it to them.